The Devil Rides Out, 1968. And if you haven't joined us before, uh, Miles, that's Miles Watts and myself, uh, taking you through the BFI's list of the best Hammer Horror films, one for each year from 1957 until when we were born in 1974. So um, good evening, Miles. Miles is a horror evangelist, would you call yourself? <laughs> Yes, praise the power. Watch the <laughs> horror films. I would, yes. I, I guess I would. Well, you know, although we've discussed this many times throughout the last uh, few episodes that we weren't always horror nuts. It's sort of something that seeped in gradually since we sort of were, were kids. We started watching horrors that we weren't supposed to be watching at our either relatives or friends' house. And it's yeah. gradually sort of blossomed into this, yeah, me making horror films, but also loving horror films. And just the more you dig in, the more wonders you can find in the world of horror. Hence, these 17 Hammer films, most of which I hadn't seen before, which is disgraceful. It's like the Dracula mist that comes in under the door and it is takes well, yeah, I think Hammer, People think they know Hammer films. They, they know Dracula. They know Christopher Lee. They know Peter Cushing, maybe. But they, when you think Hammer, they think they think. I think they probably think of Christopher Lee. The monsters. With, they think. Yeah, the monsters, perhaps, but with his Christopher Lee with his mesmer stare, you know. Mm. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've been. Uh, not only impressed with the quality of some of the films, but also just how great Hammer Studios was. Yeah, it's quite a caricature of the Hammer Studios, isn't it? Just to think mm. of it as those kind of universal monsters rebooted, because yeah. particularly as we're entering, entering the late 60s, you're getting more into this kind of um, film set in the modern day um mm. with, with, with going beyond the monsters tonight and, and going to the, the great granddaddy of them all the devil yeah. the devil yeah and and this is from um a ben wheatley novel a ben wheatley no novel. yeah sorry dennis week i don't know why i said ben wheatley because <laughs> i've just because i've watched a ben wheatley movie that's oh, okay <laughs> um uh, kill this but yeah uh, ben wheatley this is from a ben wheatley novel <laughs> ben wheatley was a famous <laughs> a cultist but yeah dennis wheatley obviously um and um apparently he really liked this adaptation um and was very pleased and also this is one of christopher lee's favorite movies what he done Yes, although he did make it very clear that he wasn't himself a Satanist, apparently. Yeah. Well, that's I think in '63 there was there was a there were, that's when they were going to make it, mm. and they couldn't because there was a bit of a panic about. So obviously by '68, Satan had you know gone out of fashion. <laughs> <laughs> a lot <laughs> changed what? in five years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, this well, was people seen... can change. You know, I you know I've mellowed in five years. I would say. I think you know, <laughs> maybe Satan by '68 was like a bit more groovy generally. Yeah, a, movies a, really weren't yeah. movies really weren't like messing with the occult back in the the, the early sixties certainly, no. uh, but but by sixty eight, do you know what other films came out in nineteen sixty eight? That is a very very good and also tricky question related um, to the devil. Is Rosemary's Baby out? In yeah, that's nineteen sixty eight. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the Witchfinder um, General with Vincent Price, which has to do with, I guess, witchcraft and, and, and Satanism. Now, that I have seen, and that is excellent. But then I, I haven't watched enough Vincent Price movies either. Every time I watch him, he's just, again, he's quite mesmerising, isn't he? Yeah. So there's a lot, And then there's like Fellini's segment of The Spirits of the Dead, which is like a portmanteau film adapting short stories by Edgar Allan Poe. And, and yeah. his bit is about the, the devil as a little girl. Yeah. So like, like the, the, the devilish doors get kicked open in 1968, I think. Yeah. And obviously by then, though, we'd had films like Roman Polanski's Repulsion and... Mm. Uh, in 65 and um and it it had opened the doors i think towards the you know we're not quite at the slasher uh phase yet but we've we're got kind of gory aren't we because like nice of the living dead's 1968 dead. as well yeah which is famously came after uh hammer's zombie yeah. film uh, which we covered um a couple of voodoo episodes. zombies yes voodoo yeah um so by this time the floodgates are opening and everyone's like right anything goes really um 
And the devil, I always found, I, I guess, as a young child watching the films, um, yeah, I mean, Frankenstein, Dracula, all of these kind of monsters in, in latex and, and um, a lot of makeup. But but the devil kind of speaks to something that is a bit more primal. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I wasn't brought, brought up in a particularly religious household, but it, it, it yeah. gets, put the willies up me. It put willies up you, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> and us all. I think the, the thing about the devil is you're only really going to be scared of the, the devil if you are... Uh, religious, I guess. Now I, I could be, you know, let, let's 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 delve into that a bit more because obviously the Devil Rides Out is very much a Christian movie in that it's got Christian iconography and Christian iconography wins out. So like praying, mm. um, love, the crucifix, that kind of stuff, which it also does in things like Buffy. So you know, you oh, can't... and the Exorcist, which is like uh, only yeah. five years after this. You know? Exorcist is like obviously the the Catholic. Um, you know, um, version of of uh, devil worshiping, um, and it's the goodness that and and the iconography again that that gets you through. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's like the devil. I always saw the devil as less scary a character yeah. as say Dracula. But then Dracula is sort of like a demon. He's like a devil. He's like an ancient devil you know yeah I, I mean i thought I, it was kind of the unknown with the devil to me because you know you know that dracula's a shapeshifter and he bites people and frankenstein's kind of this six foot hulk who can just kind of stamp on things and and, and strangle <laughs> people but True. the devil works in mysterious ways <laughs> apparently the devil will find work for idle hands, idle hands. <laughs> it does as, he does <laughs> as morrissey so eloquently sang um yeah yeah i suppose the devil is an interesting um, if if you believe in goodness, devil is absolute evil, I suppose. So it's like he's like the worst, and he's supposed to be in control of all these demons. So like whatever you think a monster or a demon is scary, it's like well the devil's the big daddy. Mm. Um, and I know this from watching Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. <laughs> you big red source of all evil. Um, so I've never found the devil scary, but but then there's really interesting things like so, you know the witch which is the Robert Eggers film um, from 2015, which is a great modern horror film. And that's, you know, that's about the devil. It's about good and evil, but it's about witches as well. So it's about the devil being able to have an influence over you at so more than appearing and going, I am the devil and I will squish you. And that's what Devil Rides Out is more about influence, evil influence. Yes, that's it. Yeah. You know. And um, I mean, Hammer have touched on the devil before. I think it would would have been um, uh, the witches. I think a few years before the, yeah. this particular film, yeah. um, which, which was is, there's a poster for the witches, as we mentioned in um, is it um, Quatermass? So yes, that's on, right. There is and on that street, that fictional street with the tube station. There's a poster for the witches, which they're doing that year as well. Which that's is right. That's, yeah, interesting yeah. product placement. And then they yeah. also had in that film. Um, the, the the kind of silhouette of the the, the devil and, and the idea was that the um, the alien life forms from the uh, that film were, were kind of the root of these um, mm -hmm. folk tales about a devil and things and so you kind of yeah. see that silhouette in the night sky that they kind of do battle with on the, the cranes at the end. I do think it's a very um, yeah that's a, that's an amazing uh, sequence. It's really quite quite disarming isn't it You're like what the hell is that giant thing yeah. um but the um i've always found the notion of devil worship as meeting in the woods whether it's witches <laughs> devils which were quite fascinating because mm. it's almost like um the crucible it's like hysteria it's like they don't necessarily need to be actually possessed by evil but they're they're so um hysterical that they believe that anything is possible and that, that and that they should sacrifice people and that, the, you know, that's what I love about it is that the people can go that mad, whether yeah. or not, whether or not there's a devil and a God, which if you don't believe it, you know, then people still can get that hyped up about stuff and go completely off the rails, which is why it's scary. I I, pe people would have been aware of kind of the occult and, and people practicing these things certainly towards the the end of the of the 60s with all the sort of psychedelics mm. and stuff like that and we've had alistair crowley sort of before that as well so i guess this is something that people are reasonably familiar with on the edge of society 
That's true. I didn't, yeah, of course, the 60s is the late 60s, it's sort of the height of the hippie craze. And people were taking hallucinogenics and stuff. And if you look at the opening credits to Devil Rides Out, which is phen- phenomenal. Actually, it reminded me of, it really reminded me of um, Live and Let Die, the credits yeah. to Live and Let Die. Yeah, which with the voodoo, yeah. With the, yeah. Yeah. That Live and Let Die, which is a fantastic, the, the production design in that and the and the graphics and the just the design of that is brilliant. I've always loved Live and Let Die. Yeah, it kind of felt almost like a proper Bond film, like at the start of the, this yeah. one. It did, actually. Yeah, you could imagine Bond appearing going, no, come on. It would, <laughs> it would be Roger in that, you know, scenario. Yes. <laughs> Although it's the late 60s, it would probably be George Lazenby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or Sean in a wig. But yeah, no, I thought it was very, from the start, again, very assured. And and I kind of love the fact that, you know, Christopher Lee's the hero in this, which is great because especially since Charles Gray is the bad guy and it's almost like Charles Gray is the vampire in this one. He's luring people and he's attracting women and men to him and hypnotizing them. Yeah, they're, they're quite, um, it's almost a two-hander with those two, the 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 the, the, the doing battle isn't it the two intellectuals um quite kind of cold calculating and um and and for all of his um dracula kind of handsome kind of almost romantic figure um he he actually plays it quite sort of sexless in this does uh, christopher lee and he actually reminded me very much of the uh the james stewart character in rope that that kind of quite calculating professor scholarly figure who particularly in the scene where he's kind of walking around the party at the start trying to work out what's going on and what people are saying it's very similar to james stewart in the the party in rope trying to kind of piece things together that's funny i thought of james stewart at one point he did i mean he has a look of him doesn't he he does he had a look and there was a mannerism halfway through where he sort of does something i was like that reminds me of james stewart but yeah Yeah. wrote definitely also he's sort of playing the peter cushing role in this christopher yeah yeah, you know he's a a, um he's a lord isn't he um or he's a duck he's a duke the the duck of richlow the duck of richlow that's right yeah he said he wanted to come back one day and do a sequel or a remake where he plays a very old duke of richlow which would have been interesting um with better special effects although i don't think the special effects in this film are bad at all actually um no it's pretty low key and as you say i think the word is assured just the whole direction art direction it, it just looks very sumptuous and and the pacing is 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 very good as well yeah and good good bunch of actors in it i think that the chap who plays uh i'm going to forget everyone's name now but if you've got the cast list of the chap who plays his best friend yeah there's there's this uh rex um yes. rex rex position as i call him because he sort right. of draws rex everything out of uh, the, yeah. the duck <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah he, he's sort of this this sort of daring do he's kind of more of the romantic figure because he yeah. kind of gets embroiled with with the kind of women in in, in the film and, and sort of is a yeah. bit of a loose cannon because of that and, and Christopher Lee has to yeah. kind of keep him in line but yeah, um, you damn fool when he's like <laughs> he rushes in you know um, he rushes in where angels fear to tread several times in the film and he's the one that like not Oh, we're gonna. I'm gonna get my girlfriend back. It's more like hey, I'm gonna rush in and punch everybody. And it's like, just wait, 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 wait. Christopher Lee's working on it. <laughs> yeah. um, she, he, yeah. was, he was dubbed in the film apparently, and no one can remember really? why. Yeah, um, Le- Leon Green, the actor who played him, was actually dubbed by a guy called Patrick Allen, who was married to Sarah Lawson, who plays Ma- Mary oh. Eaton in the film. Yeah, she's Marie- very good. And uh, yeah, he, even she can't remember why he was <laughs> needed to be dubbed because he doesn't. That's funny. His, his voice is I, fine. Sarah Lawson, I really re- recognised as well. I had to look her up on IMDb, and I was like, yeah, I've definitely seen her in lots of telly. Um, and she has a really good face. She reminds, <laughs> although she reminds me somewhat of Scylla Black in some. In some. <laughs> yeah, she scenes. does. Well, maybe I'd it's pro- the hair, but yeah, it might be the hair. I've said that about some other actress in a Hammer film recently. I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> everyone in 1967, 68, yeah, everyone looked like Scylla Black. Patrick Moa was very good as well because he played the sort of helpless, yeah, the sort of weak, weak the kind weak. of um, ward yeah. character, didn't? Yeah, yeah. It's the he, friend's he, child. He's from Emmerdale. I was like, he's got to. Yeah, he's, he's from he's Emmerdale. Tele- I thought he's in a soap. He played Rodney in <laughs> in Emmerdale. Um, and I, I must have seen him because I I watched. I must have watched Emmerdale about. The last time I watched Emmerdale was about 20 years ago. I think he was in it then, so I recognised him. Well, this uh, was a bit of a soap opera because he apparently was having a, a f- affair on screen with, um, not on screen, off screen, with uh, the, the, the woman who plays Tanith in this film. Really? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, getting a bit like a, a hammer version of Hello Magazine or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah um, so yeah, I thought the the setup was great. I really like the set, mm. and I really like the fact that you know it's a big big house in the middle of nowhere, which reminded me a bit of like eyes. Then we, I remember Eyes Wide Shut. You and I said when we when we saw Eyes Wide Shut, we said it was like a Hammer movie. Yeah, the set you know? was very yeah that sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, um, and that sort yeah. of yeah, and they're just very. They very quickly spill the beans. He's like, oh, yeah, we, we can't have more than 13 guests. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, Christopher Lee's immediately like, Ugh. and then, oh, you're sacrificing chickens as well. OK, well, you know, the game is up. But, yeah, that scene where Christopher <laughs> Lee's wandering around the party is just great when he's just listening subtly to everyone, not subtly, to everyone's very loud bits of conversation. He just picks up what's going on as he goes around. Um, brilliantly orchestrated. I love it. It is so good. Yes, yeah. Um, it's in a way the film is um, its scope is quite limited in terms of w what's happened. I mean, apparently in the original novel, in written way back in 1934, there was a, a, a kind of bigger subtext to the whole sat satanic plot. The idea yeah. was that they were trying to um, cause a war in in Europe, I think, and they were they were trying to sort of get people on on board and and um, convert them so that they they would start this great war or something. Um, and in this film, it's actually much more of a chamber piece in that it's it's really um, this character um, Simon who they're trying to to convert and yeah. Tanith, um, yeah. and um, it's not a lot more than that. They're really just trying mm. to save the souls of of, of these few people. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's why it reminded me of a vampire movie, you know, because usually yeah. there's a siren character who gets um, drawn in, and it's like, well, we've got to rescue her, you know. In Dracula, it's Mina and uh, Lucy, isn't it? And they have to, you know, Mina is unsavable. Yeah, or is it Lucy? Lucy's unsavable, um, and Mina is the sort of one that gets, you know, um, redeemed at the end. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed the fact that it was. It's like it played with the formula of of hammer but it was also very very it did its own thing but it you know like like the other ones we've enjoyed like quatermass it, it is a very much a hammer film yeah. but it's just got flourishes of of being something else um, yeah it's kind of yeah. even got a car chase which i can't remember yes. really being in any other I'm which sure amazing back out, projection <laughs> yeah. um I enjoyed that, yes, because obviously you know they're not really doing it, but some of the actual car chase bits were really good. Um, and the 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 wood suddenly Charles Gray is able to make the windscreen go white and the, yeah. the smoke appear. Um and the whole thing's that pretty much shot during the day as well, which which is doesn't detract from the creepiness because usually a hammer is like at night and the shadows and Yeah, I mean it's it's mainly set during the day apart from there's the scene of the satanic ritual to the you know the the, the satanic baptism or whatever the conversion yeah. um which is very obviously shot day for night which dr always drives me completely mad where you can see yeah. it's really obviously day for night because well, all the never, shadows are wrong and the colors are wrong and yeah they've never managed to fix that even now like now they just put like a tint on it like a blue tint yeah yeah Unless you've got loads of money like um you know jordan peele who does these amazing night yeah. times where he's able to put a huge tarpaulin over it and light it a certain way but yeah um, that's a real shame but but yeah it, it is very much today and then then it's a real chamber piece when they get into the circle at the end and, and yeah. it's all played out really in that that one room yeah and i should really shout out the screenwriter richard matheson because mm. he's someone we've mentioned on here before uh he adapted the book from Dennis Wheatley and he Richard Matheson is you know he's he's written the screenplays to some of the most fantastic things like he's written short stories that was turned into uh, Duel the movie Duel oh yeah he wrote um The Shrinking Man which was filmed as The Incredible Shrinking Man he wrote uh, I Am Legend obviously which is amazing yeah. and he also wrote um Nightmare at 20,000 Feet which was the Twilight Zone episode that with William Shatner where he says there's something on the wing um what a what a broad portfolio like oh and stuff. just dozens and dozens of short stories which are incredible he was sort of like the daphne de maurier of his time you know he, he's uh phenomenal and he and, did the screenplay yeah so and, uh terence fisher is back in the saddle for yeah. directing duties on this after being 
less than the flavor of the month after the phantom of the opera a few years ago oh bless phantom of the opera has got a place in my heart though i, I liked think. it yeah i thought it was decent yeah. enough it, it but... is really hammy but it's it's also it's also phenomenally memorable and it has a great set and some really good set pieces and it has herbert but... lom and i was watching herbert lom in the return of the pink panther yesterday mm. and uh, just oh, really? the most incredible uh dreyfus <laughs> is that the one where he disintegrates himself it's the one where he um, uh, has the um, the, the rev- revolver lighter and he keeps shooting, shooting his nose off. <laughs> <laughs> he was great. I loved those films when I was a kid. That there were films that were so like they were like live action cartoons. The Pink Panther films. Yeah, uh, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, amazing physical comedy and stuff so i would have liked to have seen peter sellers in a hammer movie that would have been good that would have been good he could have done it he could have done anything really um, so um the the goat of mendes yeah aka the devil um yeah. gets some screen time in this yeah and i'm glad they didn't kill the real goat because <laughs> you know i've seen many films where this was 1968 they weren't going to kill a goat and live on but yeah the, i like i like the goat um titles i like the goat man the devil i like the sacrificial goat and i love the iconography of the yeah the goat statues and stuff it was very it's quite brave putting the devil on on screen though because sometimes it can be more scary just as as something that's alluded to but they they put him front and center at the uh, the ritual that's true and he's not that scary sitting up there is he i mean that's scary they do it very well in the witch uh, again, I mentioned the witch. There's a scene at the end where you just see in the background a very dark figure creeping in behind Anya Taylor Joy, and it's the, and he turns into a handsome man, but it, you can hardly see it. And if you watch it in the dark, and he just whispers to her, "Wouldst thou like to live deliciously?" And it's like really that's creepier because you can't see what he's doing. Yeah, um, or I quite like these films where they make the devil into some kind of innocuous kind of little girl or something like that. Yeah. That's like kind of. Well, we've had many of them, haven't we? Yes. <laughs> yeah, if you're watching a horror movie and there's a little girl and it just run for your life. You know? <laughs> um, if there's two little girls, you've had it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I thought you know I've, I have a few friends who've mentioned uh, the Devil Rides Out as one of their favourite movies, especially it's sort of a, the classic devil worship movie, and there's been lots of them. I mentioned Blood on Satan's Claw earlier, which I used to confuse this for. Um, there's something about it's that mixture of of folklore, paganism, you know, Beltane witchcraft. Yeah, yeah. It's basically a celebration, anything like that. It's a sort of celebration and then fight against being consumed by evil. And it's not so much about possession, this this movie. No. We've got like the exorcist comings in, in, in 1973, but it's, it's, it's not about that. It is about this good against evil, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, and speaking of, you know, we haven't mentioned Charles Gray a lot of them, but Charles Gray is one of the most fantastic actors, I think. He's, he, everyone who knows him knows him for the criminologist in Rocky Horror or... Um, Maybe Blofeld. Blofeld, yeah, in, that was a few years after Diamond this. Although he was in um, a James Bond film the, the year before this, I think. He was um, uh, one of James Bond's contacts living in Japan in... Um, what film would twice. that have been? You Only Live Twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. And I also remember him in an episode of Bergerac where he was really <laughs> creepy. And, and, and he's in The Beast Must Die. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. One of the the guests, isn't it? But in in this, there's that scene in the in the drawing room with with him and the um uh the Miss the Mary Eaton character, yeah. yeah. And um oh yes, when he's when he's trying to he doesn't the... do much, but those eyes are just terrifying. Yeah. They are. They're great. He has these beautiful blue eyes, didn't he? And. Uh... Just this fantastic, well, I can't do his voice, but... He just um, takes over, takes possession of everybody in the household, doesn't he? Yeah, and his eyes appear in the, you know, the rear view mirror and stuff. And uh, yeah, he's a phenomenal presence uh, on screen. But yeah, yeah, I do like the fact that he's able to influence people um, to do his bidding. But then in the end, um, he he ends up having to be the sacrifice because it's like, well, yes. you've got your just desserts, but... Um, uh, yeah, what a good character because he's just there. Yeah. He have, like you say, he doesn't have to do much. I know he appears in a ritual at one point and they do the ritual and he says all this 
and he does all this chanting and, and you know everything but he's so calm in he's that so- scene particularly that's the really scary one and then yeah. you've got quite like the counterpoint to that you've got paul eddington um yes. from the good <laughs> life and yes minister well who, thank um... you very much jerry <laughs> <laughs> he's i know he doesn't believe in his, any of it and... he appeared with his wife and oh, i'm like, going to get a drink <laughs> yes i know he nearly breaks the circle and chris <laughs> he goes i Please, I, I beg you, as I've never begged anyone, <laughs> please stay. Um, cause he was the narrator in the Tales of the Unexpected, I think, as well, Paul Eddington. Yes. Tales of the Unexpected. Yeah. Oh, there's an opening sequence. Yeah, brilliant. They were great. They were sort of like the the twilight zone of, of, yeah. the, uh, of the 70s, weren't they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Twilight Zone, there's a series. Maybe one day we'll go through them. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them. Um, <laughs> well, they did do a follow-up to this. Hammer made another Dennis Whe- or Ben Wheatley adaptation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll never live that down, will I? <laughs> yeah, with the, to the Devil a Daughter in 1976. Yeah. But um, apparently Wheatley saw it and he told Hammer, Hammer they were never to make another of his films again. So it didn't go down as well. <laughs> it didn't go down quite as well. <laughs> I think they were floundering a bit by then, weren't they? They, they, because they did. What else? They did a remake of like the Lady Vanishes. Did the Lady Vanishes? Maybe I watched the, the Lady Vanishes the other day. Did they do the, the one with Double Shepherd and Elliot Gould? Really? Um, okay. uh, but yeah, I think they did. They did something like that, and it was not uh, that great. And I think not they well they received. they got way out of their comfort zone by then. But you can't. Thing is, you know, they, they had a good run. I mean, I was talking to one of my friends today, who's a producer, and they were saying, if basically whoever whoever's the new Hammer, I know that I know that Hammer and Amicus is dying up again. But they said Hammer used to get like a million per movie and make it, and then build a set, and then finish it, and move on and make another one. Like if that model came back in this country, yeah. there'd be a lot of happy filmmakers. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know. Um, so let's hope that continues. But you know, Hammer that kind of thing might never happen again just that kind of in-house um film factory where there were yes they were formulaic but they were also cult and popular and you know it was like a sort of repertory company oh yeah i love that i mean i loved all that kind of play for today and and um Mm. tales of the unexpected and stuff where it really yeah it was that kind of um you know you could tell it was done very much on a a budget as well but there was a lot of love in it and and um Yeah. yeah It's sort of gentlemanly filmmaking, is it? Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of gentlemen in suits wearing, you know, going, let's do this and we'll do that. And obviously there's lots of great, great actresses in there as well, but I didn't mean, you know, exclusive to, to men, but it's just, I always think of it as gentlemanly filmmaking where it's got very mannered characters uh, yes. exploring things that were... I just remembered Charles Gray. That's another thing I was going to say about Charles Gray. He played... Now, do you remember which... <laughs> Sherlock Holmes character he played and alongside whom? Oh God. Um if anyone in, in the Jeremy Brett series. Yes. Yes, it does ring a bell now. Oh, one point for Jeremy Brett. Now who did he play? Quite an important character. Did he he didn't no, he wasn't Charles Augustus Milverton, was he? No. He no. was um and he wasn't Moriarty. Nope. Well he would have made a good Moriarty. <laughs> um he played a good guy, sort of. Oh, of course he was Mycroft Holmes. He was Mycroft, yeah. Yeah. Which I I'd just, forgotten about that. Yeah. I read it. I read because I was looking at Zion TV. I'm like, I I may have seen that. I may have seen it because I seem to have seen a lot of Charles Gray stuff. I think my dad was a fan, so he had loads of stuff on video, yeah. including that episode of Bergerac with Charles Gray in it. Because you know, you knew when you were watching Charles Gray because it was you couldn't look away. Which yes, was, he made a good Mycroft the corpulent fellow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's why he's so great in this film because he's got these this mesmer stare, you know. Yes. <laughs> um, quite he reminds me a bit of um the chap from is it Anton Lesser? Is that his name? Yeah. Is I think Anton Lesser or Anton Differing? The guy he's in he's in The Beast Must Die. And he's the guy who's in the oh. control room. Um and my dad met him and said he was an amazing guy, but he always got, he always played villains. But anyway, he reminded me a little bit of, I'm going to look at, I'm going to cheat. The Antoine beast- de Con. Antoine de Con. I knew. Um, it was Anton Differing. Yeah, Pavel, that's it. Yeah. Anton Lesser is yeah. a, an amazing actor, but he's from Game of Thrones and stuff. But um, yeah, Anton Differing, he was a German uh, actor. 
but you always got typecast as Nazis. <laughs> and my dad once went into the YTV a canteen with him and everyone looked at them funny and he was like, it's not really a Nazi. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he had these piercing, piercing eyes like Charles Gray, so I used to get those two mixed up. Oh, right. um, but yeah, what an amazing bunch of actors. And I think Christopher Lee is, yeah, he's brilliant in this. I mean, he's a very, he was always brilliant, Christopher this Lee. This is one of his favourite films, isn't it? This yeah, one. He, he looks back on this very fondly. Well, he, I mean, maybe he still does from wherever he is now. Um, and and I think it, he was able to throw off his, his Dracula definitely. mantle in this. I didn't think of Dracula once in this. I just thought this guy is the Duke of Richelieu. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and, and just, maybe that like, kind of romantic lead thing. I mean, I can imagine him watching the, the 1940s, 50s Hollywood films as well and wanting kind of a bit, bit of that kind of leading man thing. Yeah, he's most. a very good leading man. He's very tall and imposing, obviously, and um, commanding. But, you know, when he, he manages to lead them all at the end um, and then at the end, obviously, when everything goes back and he says, you know, we have changed history and all of yeah. the events that happened now did not happen. I'm like, Very just... conveniently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do love that line, though, when she, you know, she gets to, the possessed lady gets to, to win out at the end over Charles Gray and that voice booms out. Uh, only those who love without desire will have the power uh, to conquer evil, I think it is. And like, yeah. well, that, that's great. What a great quote. <laughs> I wonder if that's the line from the book. Mm. I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, it's too good to be yeah. sort of non-literary, isn't it? It's it's a beautiful yeah. line. Um, but yeah, what a great set piece at the end there, despite the fact that I, at one point, spotted a bit of blue screen fire. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, otherwise, it was great. The sets are great. The, the denouement is great. Um, and it's got that lovely sort of peaceful, I mean, it's quite gaudy, the end, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it is. It's just got a nice narrative arc and um, good. So after all that devil worship, you're kind of gr glad for it. Good, you are. Good <laughs> special mean? effects. Good, well, it's a good, good score good as well. It's very loud. The score is very loud and booming and quite overbearing at times. So at the end, it's, it's peaceful. and. Um, yeah, the music's great, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah. again James Bernard, isn't it? It's James Bernard. Yeah, what a great I love those big heavy chords, but in the in the um goat scene, the sacrificial scene, um, the music really goes for it. Actually, it reminded me a little bit of uh the score for Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah. Uh, which I had to put on afterwards actually, because I really enjoyed it. Um I love that score. It's very gothic and sometimes quite shrieky and and demonic and scary, you know. Um but yeah, what a film, eh? Super. Yeah, yeah, no, it's going to be hard to top that. But next yeah. time, we are Frank is back. Yes. <laughs> 1969's Frankenstein must be destroyed. Must he? Must, must he be destroyed? Frankenstein must be. Yeah, and we've got Peter Cushing in this one as as um, Frankenstein, and he's slightly unhinged by this point, isn't he? Oh, yeah. I think he's, he's a bit crazy. And then there's some more. Peter, there's some more Christopher Lee Dracula coming up in a couple of movies time as well. So we're going to have some real great ones to to start heading towards the end. I mean, we've still got um, about four or five films left before oh, the, we've got through the list. Five, all, I think. All downhill from here. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to to some of the last ones we watch because from what I can tell, they're going to be really loopy. <laughs> really out there. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. But yeah, and again, thank you so much to everyone who listens regularly, comments, likes, shares. Um, it means a lot. And so shout out to all of you. You know who you are, Stephen, Andy. Um, and you can hear our five-hour review on Patreon. Actually, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine live reviews on Patreon? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you're really into some of these YouTubers, you watch them reacting for two hours at the same In time. Real time. Yeah, I, you know, each to their own. <laughs> I'd rather watch the movie and then watch their review afterwards for twenty minutes. But hey ho, each to their own. <laughs> All right, my friends, it's been good to catch up. Yes. Enjoy your evening and whatever you're doing tonight. Maybe just watch a horror movie instead. <laughs> Better we'll idea. Catch you next time on Hammerheads. Bye.